Welcome to the Climate Diplomacy Podcast, a podcast from the Berlin-based Think and Do Tank Adelphi, bringing you the latest insights and debates in international climate diplomacy and security. We are your hosts, Raquel Monayer. And I'm Alexandra Steinkraus. In this series, you will hear from experts and practitioners offering their take on climate foreign policy, climate-related impacts to security, and promoting peace and resilience in a changing climate. For more information, please visit climate-diplomacy.org or follow at Climate Diplo on Twitter. Hello, and welcome back to the Climate Diplomacy Podcast. Today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into climate-linked peace building and who needs to have a seat at the table during these processes. We have a bit of a special format today, but more on that in a minute. We know that evidence from around the world shows that climate change is closely interlinked with conflict, and climate change contributes to increased conflict and insecurity along these indirect pathways, such as undermining livelihood conditions and also via intermediate factors, such as governance or also inequality. And those working to improve social cohesion, peace, or security can and should integrate ways to build resilience towards climate security risks into peace programming and make sure that it's a core consideration of preventing, mitigating, and also resolving violent conflicts. As mentioned at the top of the episode, today is a little bit of a special one. I am Sans' co-host today, and rather than interviewing one guest, today I'm going to be guiding us through insights on the Peace Pillar Initiative, its five pilot projects, using some interviews that were conducted at the end of April when we had project partners from Adelphi, the Berkhoff Foundation, Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, European Institute of Peace and Innovations for Poverty Action here in Berlin for a workshop. As a little bit of background to the initiative before we kick things off, the Peace Pillar is a fairly new initiative and it was launched in 2022 and it's sharing and elevating evidence-based recommendations in mainstreaming climate security to support sustainable peace processes on the ground. It's guided by the analytical approach of weathering risk and the initiative translates climate security foresight and analysis into peace building action where it's needed the most. The initiative is currently in its very first phase and implements a number of pilot projects in Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Nigeria, and the Bay of Bengal. And these pilot projects are conducted by experienced peacebuilding organizations in regions that are severely affected by climate and conflict risks. Now, I want to start us off discussing the impact of the Peace Pillar, starting off with some insights from Adelphi's Janani Vivekananda and Ricardo Morel from Innovations for Poverty Action. Importantly, we're not just implementing these projects, but also gathering impact. We need to show the difference that integrating climate security into peace building makes. One, to know for ourselves whether this is actually useful, whether it's making a difference to peace. And two, with an evidence base built up, we can actually make the case to other donors, be they climate donors or conflict donors. The Peace Pillar will monitor and evaluate the impacts on peace generated by its pilot projects. The results of impact assessments will contribute to ongoing implementation through empirical learning to ensure successful interventions. The collected lessons learned, best practices, and insights about the compound risks caused by the interaction of insecurity and climate change will be shared with practitioners and policymakers to create a growing evidence base and enable more targeted and systematic climate-informed peace-building programming in the future. It's important to note that it's not only best practices and lessons learned on what to do that is important. It's not replicating what 
doesn't work so well and it's not duplicating so we can then really ensure that the resources are going where the needs are so projects like weathering risk peace pillar help to identify the learnings from shared experiences from these good practices and really distill this so that we can see what can be scaled up and where our goal is that the evidence we generate actually is translated into action so we beyond an academic paper we want policy recommendations that are actually actionable. Yeah, that's an important one. Like sharing the results with local stakeholders is very important for us as well. Throughout the interviews, one of the key themes partners touched on was the importance of working with local communities and infrastructures in order to actually meet the needs of these communities and create sustainable programming. First, we're going to hear from our partners at the Berko Foundation working on the pilot project in Somalia, Abbas Kasim and Janelle Galenik. As a little bit of background for listeners unfamiliar with the context, Somalia's rainy season in 2022 was the driest in seven decades, and conflict has been exacerbated as a result of resources having grown scarcer. Currently, there are just under 3 million internally displaced persons in Somalia facing growing insecurities. And this pilot project in Somalia being implemented by Berkhoff focuses on contributing to the constructive transformation of cycles of conflict, climate change, and environmental degradation. I think the best idea is to base interventions on the needs of the communities and really consult with the communities on what the problems are and not just come with projects and interventions just because the donor wants it to be implemented in a certain way. So it has to be need-based and they should consult with stakeholders from different groups within the community, be it the community elders, the religious leaders, youth, women, different groups within the communities, as well as the district administration, which is very important because they are the ones who are driving these processes within the communities. So it's very important that they're consulted with and get ideas from them on the best ways to implement projects within the, the grassroots level. So the Berka Foundation has been working in Somalia since 2015, and our entire approach is set up according to infrastructures for peace, basically local infrastructures for peace. So we work with networks of what we call insider peace builders, and these are 100 plus people across the states of Hirshabella State and Galmaduk State. And they have been working with us for many years. They are embedded in their communities. They have a platform to work for peace and for mediation. It's a very diverse group of people from elders to youth activists to teachers, journalists, and, and they all work together. And we've been working with them in terms of capacity development for many years. So when we started working on climate security about two and a half years ago, the structure that we had already sent, set up. One of our partners at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, Chris Agoha, working on the pilot project in Nigeria, also echoed the importance of working with local communities and stakeholders In recent years, farmer herder disputes over natural resources have led to violence and thousands being killed in recent years. Natural disasters and inhospitable conditions have displaced additional thousands. Building trust and confidence through dialogue is one of HG's priorities. And during the interviews, he touched upon the importance of integrating communities in the diaspora into their approach. In this, our approach, we engage local communities, local stakeholders, and this include traditional rulers, religious leaders, women and youth groups, communities that are in the diaspora because they are a critical element to any peace process we are engaging and then also the affected communities. The objective is to ensure equitable management and sharing of available resources. At these levels, this actually forms our entry point in trying to get them resolved on the round table, hold dialogue, and then for them to mutually agree to resolve issues through sharing, through management by themselves. The important element is that for any international organization to achieve success, you must be able to have the trust and confidence of the people. Otherwise, you will fail. 
So in our respective engagements, a colleague was asking me, how do you really penetrate? What is your starting point? Of course, our starting point is that we do conflict analysis and conflict mapping. And then in the pre-dialogue, we we'll try to identify these key stakeholders. You go to them and talk to them. If they agree, then you now, during the dialogue, you now bring them on the table, round table. You now discuss with them, these are what we want to do. And then if they give you the consent, then you proceed. For us, we have never been turned down. There are some organized, international organizations that they come, they are not accepted. But for us, we have been able to get commendation from the governor of Benue State, who said when we resolve that 50 years pond crisis over, conflict over fishing pond, the governor told us that HD is the only international organization that has succeeded in resolving this conflict. While consortium partners have highlighted the importance of integrating local communities into the work the Peace Pillar partners are doing, before moving on, I just want to highlight an example shared from Clara Pergola from the Berkhoff Foundation's local partner organization, Peace Paradigms Organization, that's working in Iraq. Iraq is one of the countries that is most vulnerable to climate change, and for decades, it has experienced ongoing conflict, including from the war and its legacy, ISIS, and internally disputed territories. This is happening against the backdrop of repeated cycles of intense violence, conflict, and insecurity. And there is the risk that the conflict dynamics will worsen as climate change becomes more severe hindering the Iraqis' population ability to build climate resilience. Her insights provide an example of how this insecurity and need to survive can be a driver of extremism. A series of villages does not receive enough water to be able to water their agricultural lands. So then farmers along a canal are going to drill illegal wells and this kind of thing, so violate the water distribution along the way. And Depending where this is going to happen, this might just turn into an inter-village, inter-tribal conflict. So the cause is going to be just like someone needing more water to like water the land, but that's going to escalate. It's something much wider, and that's not something that was existing before. I think it's also reinforcing... If we think about, let's say, like drivers of extremism in Iraq, for example, quite honestly, the ideological aspect was never what made extremist groups successful in the past. There can also be challenges when it comes to centering the experiences and voices of affected communities. First, Janelle Galvinik from Berghoff provides important insights on how bureaucratic processes can really hinder this. I think it's really important to mention the incredible motivation of Somalis. They are really very enthusiastic about saving their country. And I think this really needs to be taken into consideration because they are excellent people to work with on this. And yes, there are always going to be challenges working on local level and working with government actors, but this is a very critical life-threatening situation for them. And they realize that as well. So I would just advocate for supporting them in any way we can to make sure that they still have a home to live in 20 years. All of what we do in Somalia is not confidential or secretive in any way. We're very open about the work we do because we think it's really necessary for others to know about the climate security work we do and the achievements that are being made. I think Somalis have a difficult time on the international stage communicating for themselves. For instance, it's impossible to get Somalis visas to come to any sort of panel discussion, for instance. I sometimes feel that I'm an interpreter. I work with my Somali colleagues and with 100 plus peace builders, and I have tried very hard to get their voices up onto the international stage. And I think any way we can make this happen more through better visa processes or being able to offer interpretation at events so that Somalis can speak for themselves would be really helpful. Hisham al omesi from the EIP pilot project in Yemen also gave insights into difficulties bringing in Yemenis into the dialogue and how this can lead to resistance among local populations. So we have to do a lot more. We have to kick into high gear in Yemen in raising awareness, building capacity, and really working hard to bring Yemenis into the dialogue. 
so that they can have their own say. Some of the things we found out back home is that when we talk to them about solution, global solutions, and we talk, for instance, to farmers in certain areas in the country, and we're like, here is a best practice that's been used in Myanmar, and for instance, in Nigeria or the DRC or whatever. And they come back to us and they say, but there are ways that have been done in Yemen locally. These are locally led solutions that have worked for us for the past 3,000 years, and they work well. And there's, there's some resistance to adopting new technologies, adopting new approaches, but that's because they weren't part of the dialogue. They weren't brought into the fold. They've been marginalized for so long. When it comes down to it, if voices from affected communities aren't centered in the discussion or brought into the dialogue, their main priorities and even their understanding of the interaction between climate change and the environment can be misconstrued. Albert Martinez from EIP also provided some additional insights from Yemen on how Yemeni society prioritizes the environment. So the main problem that we had in Yemen is that what is happening or what is on the table of negotiations for the peace processes and more, it's never the environment. And then, of course, however, what we realized is that by talking to the Yemeni society, different stratas and different groups of the Yemeni society, is that, again, the environment is one of the main priorities. And they're very aware of how the environment is creating tensions and conflicts. For what we do at EIP is really through a consultation. We have collected all of this data. We have collected the different voices of Yemenis from many different governorates and different governorates that are controlled from under the Yemeni government, but also under the Houthis. So it's actually like a lot of work that we have put into really trying to collect different voices from different parts of Yemen. And what we're doing to really put these voices forward, there are two things. One is we're creating or facilitating some, facilitating some dialogues so that these voices are shared with important people that are decision makers at the governorate level. But apart from that, we're also trying to get all of these voices at the very high level of the politics in Yemen. So this is to say that what we're trying to do is that all of the preoccupations and worries at the environmental level of the Yemeni people we're really trying to put it next to the political and next to the peace discussions at a very high level. Before we broaden the conversation a little bit, Clara from Peace Paradigms Organization in Iraq also highlighted the risk of bringing stakeholders together without a clear vision of what needs to be achieved. The issue of climate change is, is currently basically raising a lot of attention and we're actually already seeing parallel structures of different stakeholders, like say like donors between them or international organization between them or a mix of both or at the governmental level in Iraq, for example, there are structures here and there being created not with a clear vision of what is it they're trying to achieve, just because they know that they need to talk to each other, but they don't really know what to talk about. And basically, given, let's say, like the urgency with which, for example, some international donors are trying to support addressing this issue, which is great, there's a significant risk that without a clear strategy and, and agreement on how we're going to do this together, there's also going to be basically a lot of resources and time that are going to be wasted. And yeah, I mean, in Iraq, at the moment, it looks like that's what's already happening, right? We hear this organization is setting up a coordination platform and, oh, this organization is actually supporting the government doing this. But this organization also has planned to, and that's something that is quite risky, honestly. So Peace Pillar partners are working with a variety of stakeholders in order to implement their projects. In the Bay of Bengal, environmental degradation, depleting fish stocks, and climate change are severely impacting the region. A high dependency on the marine environment of the Bay, one of the most densely populated regions of the world, is posing a serious threat in terms of food security, livelihoods, and economic development. During the interviews, Shrajit Suganan from Humanitarian Dialogues pilot project in the Bay of Bengal highlighted the importance of working with governments through dialogue in order to meet the scale of the problem and why a coordinated response is required for effective policies. Peace Pillar partners are working with a variety of stakeholders in order to implement their projects. In the Bay of Bengal, environmental degradation, depleting fish stocks, 
and climate change are severely impacting the region. A high dependency on the marine environment of the Bay, one of the most densely populated regions of the world, is posing a serious threat in terms of food security, livelihoods, and economic development. During the interview, Shrajit Suganan from the Humanitarian Dialogue Pilot Project in the Bay highlighted the importance of working with governments through dialogue in order to meet the scale of the problem and also addressed why a coordinated response is required for effective policies. I think governments are ultimately the decision makers. And when we are thinking about the scale of the problem that we are trying to address, none of the individual decision makers or the individual countries can proactively come up with policies that will address this because it's a much larger problem. So this requires a coordinated approach by the governments who are affected by this. So that's one of the reasons why we want to engage all the governments. And it's also important that the policies are, they find all the governments find it useful as well. They should be happy with the outcomes that we are arriving at. So it's important to include all the stakeholders while considering policy making for the Bay. I think information sharing or knowledge sharing makes us arrive at solutions better. So climate change is affecting the entire globe. So experiences in other parts of the world are relevant for people in the Bay as well to understand what experiences and lessons have been learned in other jurisdictions. And it gives a basket to choose from the most utilizable one and the one that is most useful for the context. So in that sense, it becomes very important to understand how other regions have worked around the problem. Another important theme that came up again and again throughout the course of the interviews was the importance of dialogue. In one of the videos that we're actually producing from these interviews, we focus on dialogue between geographies and regions. But for this podcast, I really want to highlight the importance of setting up dialogues with local communities. And first, we'll hear insights from Abbas Kassim from the Bear Coast Foundation pilot project in Somalia. The platforms are particularly for communities and people from different constellations attend these dialogue platforms and they get an opportunity to learn about the impact of climate change, which of course they are already aware of and they've been experiencing for many years and have their own traditional ways of coping with those impact of climate change. But getting a platform to really talk about these issues and share ideas and come up with mitigation measures and also a lasting solution to the conflicts is what they are lacking. And that's what we are providing under the framework of this project. And one of the most important takeaways is that the communities are already experiencing this impact of climate change, but they've never had a platform to come together to share these ideas and come up with solution. And it's very important to create more platforms like this in different avenues, in different areas, so that communities can come together and come up with ideas of finding solutions to these problems. Dialogue can also be a way to elevate voices of local community to the global dialogue. Since 2014, Yemeni people have been experiencing a civil war affecting their lives at the most basic level. Scarcity of water and food insecurity are common across the country. And Yemen's security and environmental crisis is worsening with climate change causing drier seasons and more frequent extreme weather events. Hisham Alomesi and Albert Martinez from EIP shared some insights on how the pilot project they're working on focuses on voicing the needs of priorities of people from Yemen. One of the main things that I just wanted to share is that this kind of dialogue, there's been a bit of a disconnect between what's happening in Yemen and the international community. This is one of the things, for instance, when we launched our program and we talked to some rural areas and some of the concepts are not very clear to Yemenis because they haven't been part of the global dialogue yet on climate change. So they siloed, they feel they've been marginalized, but also they feel that, you know what, 
we will stick to our old practices. So by bringing them into the fold, by inviting them to the table, by sharing knowledge, by sharing best practices, you help them improve and get out of that mindset. But it's all about inclusivity at the end of the day. You need inclusivity. I think something that we're very really interested at EIP is communications. The way in which we put a narrative around the world, it's very important. And this is how a story is going to stick. And this is how different projects are going to be more, they're going to have more impact really when we share these projects with other partners and also with the international arena. So I would say something that I would stress a lot is really try to put an effort on working on communications, trying to design a strategy that is helpful, that's very clear on the audience and the messaging, and that has some stories that are relatable as well. One of the reasons we place an emphasis on different kinds of communication formats, like this podcast, for instance, is to help increase visibility of these topics, projects, and new developments within them. During our conversations, during the interviews, partners also reflected on the importance of communication and visibility, not only in disseminating information, but also in order to amplify voices of local communities. First, I want to start with some insights from Hisham again and how social media played a role in the Yemeni youth uprising. I'm actually glad you asked that question because we've had what we call the Yemeni youth uprising, which ran in parallel with the Arab Spring. And back at the time before that, social media wasn't really that big in Yemen, not even the region. But during that time, everybody started taking to Facebook, to take into Twitter, creating their own blogs to amplify their voices and also address all these issues and carry out these dialogues. And in our project now, we're also going to be relying on that and as well, of course, to make people raise awareness of the public, but also make people aware of the discussions that are ongoing and collating information, knowledge sharing, building these coalitions and disseminating information to the public at large. But one of the main challenges there was what kind of channels do we use? Do we use YouTube? Do we use Facebook? Do we use Twitter? And we ended up doing mapping processes. What would be the best channels to use in each locality? Because each locality is very distinct. In some areas, Facebook is more popular than Twitter. And other areas in Yemen, for instance, one of the things that we found out is that WhatsApp is more popular than everything else. People communicate through WhatsApp. It's massive. WhatsApp is massive in Yemen. So then in WhatsApp, it becomes a little bit tricky because you have to have access to specific groups. You're not just speaking into the void. You have to have access to specific groups. So it's a different process of approaching your communication strategy. But there's another layer to that as well. You need uh, metrics to gauge the success of your communication. And on Facebook and on Twitter, it's pretty easy because you have analytical tools that you can reach, basically gauge your reach, your engagement level, and what have you. On WhatsApp, it becomes a little bit tricky. But again, this is where the workshop comes in here and the various partners that we have in the consortium is that everybody brings their own expertise and we have IPA here, for instance, and they're sharing their best practices and lessons learned from other areas of how people did it in other parts of the country and other regional areas. While we're on the topic of communication, Christian Gulish from the Berko Foundation's Iraq Project brought up some important points about communication gaps when it comes to how people talk about climate change, peace building and conflict, and why awareness raising and priorities need to center local populations and communities. Abbas from the Berko Foundation Somalia Project also highlighted the importance of knowledge sharing platforms, including social media, in order to better coordinate efforts. So we have usually an effect that our work in the country produced quite some expertise and knowledge on peace building, facilitating agreements, finding solutions to different conflicts as well. And the issue is now how to integrate in certain expertise of climate change capacities in there. Because usually the problem is also that those 
people speak different languages and not only languages itself, but also the technicalities they use and to bridge that divide and the gap of communication of understanding would also increase the awareness. And that is also something that is currently quite lacking, that you have still a lack of awareness, especially at the national level of most of the context that we're working on, because the priorities are just different there. They have to cater also for public needs and public perceptions, whereas the local population and the local communities, they are much more aware of how climate change and climate risks are affecting their life as well, because they can see it. They feel if there's a summer without rain, they feel if there's a sandstorm coming through much more than the centralized government agencies. And sometimes it's difficult to explain if you're working on conflict or if you're working on climate change and climate risks. And to bring these two worlds together is sometimes very difficult also to perceive by a local population that is used to a different language by other donors, primarily in the humanitarian sector or in the political division sector. So therefore, to bring these two together and to collect the data needed that would also inform our project design and our programming was a challenge at the beginning and we had to adapt to that accordingly and to dig deeper, have more qualitative approaches rather than quantitative data that would enable us at the beginning to compare. But at the end, it was more important for us to really see and find suitable data and research findings to really inform our programming properly. We are showcasing our work in various platforms, be it social media, be it our website, or website that's specifically made for the IPN members to showcase their work and in from various villages and districts that they visit and implement work. And we are also sharing lots of information with our stakeholders in various areas to really put the word out there and share our work, be transparent with it so that it can empower and influence other changes within the communities and the country at large. So we coordinate quite a lot also with other partners in the field of climate conflict nexus, particularly in Somalia. And we are now in talks with relevant authorities, such as the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, to find a platform where organizations working in this field can come together, learn from each other and coordinate their efforts. One of the things that became very clear during this workshop and while conducting the interviews is that learning and exchange are not only useful, but really necessary in these contexts. And the Weathering Risk Peace Pillar is at the forefront of this new field where very little exists in terms of best practices and lessons learned. And when it comes to climate change, peace building, security, if we don't learn from each other along the way, we're losing time that we just don't have. This initiative is generating new evidence and creating a space for learning and exchange in order to collect these lessons learned, best practices and insights about the compound risks caused by the interaction of insecurity and climate change to help create a growing evidence base and enable more targeted and systematic climate for peace building programming in the future. To learn more about the project, you can go to weatheringrisk.org slash peace pillar. And a big thank you to all of our project partners that attended the workshop and took part in the interviews. This month's podcast wouldn't have been possible without all the great contributions. This has been the Climate Diplomacy Podcast. We will be back with another episode in a few weeks. Follow our latest updates on Twitter at Climate Diplo, and you can also find us on LinkedIn. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, goodbye.